Well, good morning and welcome to day 31 of our 40 days of fasting and prayer. Uh, we have been fasting secular media, social media, and just lowering the voice that of the world that just comes at us from all directions. Well, as many of you know, Pastor Jerry, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, chose for us 40 passages of scripture, one for each day of the 40 days of fasting and prayer for us to use, to uh, meditate on, to walk through, to hear God through. And so we've been taking those passages each of these 40 days. And today's passage is Psalm 51 verses one through three from the New Living, uh, New King James Version, actually. Let's read that passage and then let's take a look at what's going on around this passage. It says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Well, this is the Psalm of David. So this is David crying out to God. He's praying to God. The Psalms are, are traditionally prayers and songs of praise uh, from various uh, people. We have the songs of Asaph, we have David. Um, but just as God has been so faithful to us to give us the scriptures for all kinds of reasons, I love the Psalms because for me, throughout my journey with the Lord, time and time again, he has brought me to the Psalms and he has used them to help me have the words that I need to bring to him. They so often speak the very things that I can't verbalize or don't even understand that I need to verbalize, but he will use them to walk me through the process, whether it be a process of praise, a process of, in this case, we're looking at a repentance, so often we need the help because we don't always understand uh, how to do this. And God is so good. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we know that he says that, God, that all scripture is inspired by God. Some uh, translations would say, instead of inspired, it would say God breathed. God breathed out or spoke his words into scriptures and gave them to us. And they're profitable for us. They walk us through. And so I know so many times in my life, the Psalms have been my words, the words I needed. God is so good. Not only does he tell us to come and bring words and come to him and repent, but he says, I'll even give you the words. I'll even help you. And so I, for one, love this. And to this morning, I believe that at the end of our time together, we're going to be able to take these words and come before the Lord. But before we do, I want to take a look at what's going on when David is praying this. What's happening What's making him pray this? What's making him call out to God this way? Because it certainly appears that he is repentant and is coming to God and crying out for him to wash him and blot out his sins. But what's interesting about this passage uh, of scripture is that it's written during a time where David was not acknowledging his sin, where he was not. In fact, this says that he wrote this after Nathan the prophet came to him and confronted him regarding his sin. So David had committed sin and it, it, he didn't repent. He didn't do anything. He didn't fix it. So God had to send a prophet, as he often will do, to come and confront him. And that's when David began to turn and seek God and then ultimately repent and call out to God. So we can see that passage uh, of Scripture, historical, accurate uh, information in 2 Samuel, starting in chapter 11. Basically, as the story goes, um, the at the time where kings are out to war, it says, so normally they're out to war, as was the armies of Israel out at war. Uh, David was home at his palace. And one evening he looks out and he sees a woman bathing on the roof of her home, which would be not an uncommon practice because it would be a place of privacy, you would think, uh, to cleanse yourself. But he sees her, he inquires about her, he asks someone, uh, who is she? And he's informed who she is. He's told her name is Bathsheba and that she's the wife of Uriah the Hittite who is in David's army and he's out at war. He's actually uh, a man of authority. He has people, troops that report to him and he of course reports to the commander of the armies of Israel which was uh, Joab at the time. Um, and so David knowing this, fully knowing this, has her brought to him. She comes to him and ultimately he commits adultery with her and um, 
sends her back home. He receives word from her some time later saying that she's pregnant. So David, you would hope at this moment, would turn his heart to God and ask God to forgive him and give him instruction on what to do next. But that's not what we see what happens. Even though we know that David is called by God to lead the children of Israel. He's a man after God's own heart. The scriptures clearly show God chose him, put him in this position of authority. God loved him, trusted him. He loved God. There's no indication that he didn't love God and serve God. In fact, well, served him well. Uh, And yet we see him in this moment of time making these really horrendous decisions. So instead of repenting at this point and asking for God's direction, he comes up and devises a plan. He has uh, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, brought in from the battlefield where he's out serving the country, serving David, actually. Brings him in, meets with him, and um, gets an update about what's going on in the the field with the troops. And then he encourages him to go home and uh, basically be with his wife uh, before he returns to the battlefield. Well, Uriah declines. He, He leaves David's present, but he de- the presence, but he declines to go home. He sleeps outside the palace under the stars outside. When he's asked the next day why he didn't go home, but David inquires, why didn't you go home and enjoy your uh, the comfort of your home and be with your wife? And Uriah responds by letting him know that how could he do that when his troops and his commander, Joab, are all out in the field sleeping outside? How could I go home and have the comfort of being with my wife and being in my home. Uh, No, I couldn't do that. And so I stayed outside. Well, so we see that he's a man of integrity. Uh, In this situation, we can see that he's really uh, a man of deep integrity. Well, David um, decides to invite him. He says, oh, I'm going to have you stay one more night. Invites him over. Basically, as the story tells us, that he had him drink a lot and basically tried to get him really drunk in hopes that he would not walk in integrity, which might be a reminder that drinking alcohol often leads us to make poor choices. David knew that because that's why he's trying to plow him with alcohol. Some of you hearing this, uh, you may be hearing right now that that God's calling you to lay that kind of stuff down because you keep wondering why you end up in situations of, uh, that lack integrity. And it may be that you need to lay down alcohol, even in a small amount. Uh, that was just uh, a sense from the Lord right now, but we see that Uriah does not do that. That even drinking alcohol, he does not lay down that integrity. He does not go home and sleep with his wife. Uh, ultimately he returns back to the field having not been with his wife. So David is now foiled in his plan to conspire against Uriah and to have him go sleep with his wife so he could then just let it be that his son, David's son, that would come forth from Bathsheba would be raised as Uriah's. But this conspiracy, this uh, premeditated plan does not pay out. So uh, what's his next move? Well, basically he calls for the commander over Uriah and he gives him instructions telling him, look, when the next hot battle when there's a fierce battle that comes next i want you to put uriah at the front of the line uh to ensure that he doesn't make it and sure enough as the historical record of second samuel tells us uriah was killed in battle and both david and bathsheba are informed of this so when bathsheba hears of this the bible says that she mourned Um, we have no reason to believe that she wanted her husband dead we only have the information that is given to us in the scriptures that show that David made this decision. David had the power to do this, and apparently he felt entitled in this time to use this authority in whatever way he desired. This is not something that marked his uh, leadership ongoingly, but this was a moment in time where we see that he made really poor choices and he continued to cover. And in fact, the sin, I would say, and I think most would agree that it, it, the first one conceived a small one, sin nonetheless, by even maybe viewing her, watching her, looking upon her and desiring her uh, to then go up a little further, bring her in and commit adultery with her and then conspire to this whole, uh, conspiracy of having your son raised by someone thinking it's his son and he would think none of which worked but then it went and there was a conspiracy ultimately to murder and I believe that's also uh, a message within there for us that sin begets sin 
that when we sin, it is absolutely imperative that we come quickly before the Lord, acknowledge our sin. Clearly, David was not acknowledging his sin. So we see as the story goes on, we see that David, um, after her time of mourning, calls for her. So there's this period of mourning. David calls for Bathsheba to be brought in and he makes it her his wife. So probably in his thinking, he now has resolved it. He's, this is going to be his wife. He's made her his wife and um, they're going to have a baby. But we see shortly after that Nathan the prophet comes before him. So Nathan is a prophet of God and he comes before David and he in chapter 12. Incredible story. You should go back and read these today. I would encourage you to read uh, 2 Samuel 11 and 12. I'm giving you an overview, but it's an incredible story to, to go and read. In, in chapter 12, we see that Dave, uh, Nathan comes to David, the king. This man has incredible power. Basically, nobody's going to confront him. Nobody's going to tell him, you shouldn't do this. When he inquired about who she was and someone told us, and then he said, bring her to me, these people knew what he was doing, but none of those people are going to confront him. Because why? Because he is the king and you just don't do that. There's just something about powerful people. But God sent in a prophet and he comes and he shares this story, uses a, a, a story to ask him, well, so there's a man who has uh, all that he could have. There's everything he's been given so much. And then there's someone else who only has one little sheep and he takes that sheep. And instead of taking one from the many he has and he's been given, he decides to take the one that's to this man, the only one this man knows. It's a great Great story. And and what would you think should happen to this man? And David responds to Nathan and says, that man, you know, he needs to pay. That th Surely he shall die. I mean, like, this is a terrible thing. In fact, I think it says that he needs to repay four times what he's taken. It's just terrible. And I think he actually even uses language like, you know, as surely as I live, like, this thing needs to happen and that person needs to be judged. And Nathan's response to him is, you are that man. And he's referring to the fact that God's given David so much. He's given him the choice of wives. He's given him power and authority. He's given him everything. And then you have Uriah, a man who has just the one wife. He's a man under authority. He's, he's got little compared to all that David has. And yet David, instead of choosing from it, many of the options that he would have had as a king to have multiple wives and concubines even, um, again, not in our time in, in, that we live in, but this was common then. He had many choices, but yet he chose to take this man's one wife. And uh, boy, in that moment, David realized that he was a sinner and this threw him into a, a time of repentance. And there's a lot of things that happen, including the fact that he uh, turned back to the Lord and the Lord forgave him. In fact, right there on the spot, David says that the Lord has removed your sin from you. However, he says the child is not going to live. Um, and, the, and as the story goes, the, David's son, the one that he conceived with Bathsheba, ultimately died. Dave, uh, David prayed, he repented, he fasted in hopes that the child would live. The child did not live. Um, and then they moved on and they had, um, after that, and after this time of repentance, they went on and they had a, a son who would later become king of Israel as well, known as Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived from this very couple. So good things can be redeemed later. But I want to talk about the fact that we see here a man who's been given so much power and authority, so much, and yet he felt entitled. I believe that the Lord would say to us, we need to check our entitlement. This is what I believe the Lord is saying out of this. Now, obviously, the things that are very clear in this passage, we know that. You should not commit adultery. You should not covet your neighbor's wife, right? It's one of the Ten Commandments. You shouldn't look upon women and lust after them. You certainly shouldn't go a step further and take and commit adultery with someone else's wife. You also should not commit conspiracy and continue to cover up the sin and give up your own child to be raised by others or to trick someone into believing it's their child. Uh, you should not commit murder. Okay, these are very clear. Not one of us would uh, deny that. But most of us would read that story and think, well, I haven't done that. But I want to tell you something. I believe what really is at the heart of this. There's an entitlement. Something came upon David in that season. This is not, he's not marked by this. He's a man who loves God. He lives for God. He, I mean, there's just no one like him in terms of serving God and loving God. But yet we see this moment in his life where I believe there's just a sense of entitlement. Like I can do what I want uh, and I'll just keep going. And we find ourselves in a trap and it's that that the Lord would have us look at in our own lives. For many of us, 
God is not saying, well, you've committed adultery. Okay, listen, and if you have, those things have already been dealt with. But God today would speak to us, his children, the leaders. Every one of us is a leader on this earth because we are the children of God. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And so we are leading others into the kingdom. And God, I believe, is saying, be careful to not be entitled and think that you can do what you want and break my commandments. Okay, David, in his comfort, in his power, began to break the commandments of God, starting with one, and then it just increased. And we, now more than ever, need to guard our hearts from a sense of entitlement. Like, well, I can do whatever. I, God's got me. There's even a sense of like, well, I don't have to worry because, you know, no weapon formed against me will prosper. Listen, uh, the word of God is true. And God speaks to his people and says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. But, you know, we got to walk within God's laws. We got to obey him. We got to fulfill our part by walking in obedience. The Bible says that obedience is better than sacrifice. God is looking for us to walk in obedience. And as we do, he protects us. As we follow him and listen to his directives and obey him, he covers us and protects us. But we at no time are we permitted to just do as we want, to break the laws of God, to, to from the big things to the little, just as most of us would, all of us would say, of course you should not commit adultery. If I were to ask you, is it okay to commit adultery? You'd say no. Is it okay for you to uh, lie? Most of you would say no. We all should say no. It is not okay for us to lie. It is not. We must walk in the commands of God. Should we gossip? Should we backbite? Should we curse others? No. And so it's very important that we as believers don't get complacent and entitled and think, well, I could just curse the leaders of government. That's not, God did not give us permission to do that. He said that we should pray for those in authority. He's given us instruction and we cannot be breaking them. So I believe that God is, uh, Warning us, we look at the scriptures, it's all prof all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for rebuke, for instruction and in righteousness, that the men and women of God, men of God, may be thoroughly equipped, complete. God wants us to be complete. He wants us to know what to do and how to live, and he wants us to walk in obedience and not fall into patterns of sin and then covering those sins. So David comes before God ultimately after so many of this. He acknowledges this and we hear him, boy, this is the heart. That story of the man I just told you about, uh, committing adultery, covering it, conspiring, getting the guy drunk and trying to send him home to go be with his wife, to cover his own tracks and then sends him out and, and has him murdered. He's, he is responsible for that murder. He may have not done it with his physical hands, but he did that murder. He sent him out there to be murdered and awaited word for it to be so. He was guilty of murder. And finally, we see after the prophet comes and confronts him, we see him finally recognize, oh my goodness, I am a sinner. In fact, he responds to Nathan the prophet by saying, uh, I am a sinner and I have sinned against God. And we see here now this passage that is our focus today where he says to God, have mercy upon me, O God according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sins are always before you. Well, finally we see David acknowledge his sin and see it and not just keep plowing through it. And this morning, could we come before the Lord could we call out using this passage of God-breathed scripture, words that have come from God's own mouth, could we use these words and ask God to wash us? So often there's areas of our life where we're walking in entitlement and we don't want that. We don't want to just assume we can do what we want and God will protect us. That is not the case. David lost a son. They, that child died. What we can be sure of is this, that God's saying, if you'll come to me, you know what the price that will get paid? My son. I gave my son. David lost his son. His, the child died. But God gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him, if we would confess our sins, that we would be healed. So we, like David, can come before him using this passage. So let's pray. Let's get before the Lord. Let's 
Ask the Lord to show us and reveal to us our iniquity, the things we can't see. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your scriptures that you have given us. Would you just thank him for the word of God that's been given to you, to guide you, to correct you, to give you sound doctrine for him to speak to you through his word. Lord, I thank you for the word of God that time and time again, your word is truth. Your word reveals truth to us. And Lord, as we come before you this morning, we acknowledge that we need your mercy. So we, like David, cry out, have mercy on us, O God, on us individually, on our families, on our family lines, Lord, on our cities and our nation. O Lord, have mercy on us according to your loving kindness, because you are good and you are faithful. We are broken and we miss it. Though you have called us, though you have forgiven us, though you have given us much freedom and goodness and authority, yet time and time again, we find that we miss it. But according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out our transgressions. Oh, today, would you call upon God to blot out your transgressions? Lord, blot it out. Cause it to be no more. My sins, my transgressions, the, the transgression is to, to break the rules, to break the law. Lord, we, oh, we have been lawless. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray by your spirit, even as we're wrapping up our time together, that you, by your spirit, would speak to every heart individually right now, those joining I believe the Holy Spirit is highlighting to you areas of lawlessness, transgression, where we break or walk over the line. Not to condemn you, but to cause you to come before him and ask for his cleansing. So Lord, we come, I come, and I ask that you would wash us thoroughly in our iniquity. Remove our iniquity. Cleanse us from our sins. Remove all arrogance, presumption, and and entitlement from me. Show it to me and cleanse me. Oh, cleanse your church, oh God. The body of believers, your bride, Lord, remove it. Because if David was susceptible to it, surely we are. But we have been given your spirit and the price has been paid so we can ask to be cleansed and see that that sin can be place to Jesus's account and that he has paid it for. So we thank you. We acknowledge it today, Lord, like David, we acknowledge our transgressions and we see it. It's before us. We see it. We ask that you would wash it from us personally, from our families and from our nation in Jesus mighty name, Lord. We thank you that the blood of Jesus does indeed wash us and cleanse us and that you are opening our eyes and transforming our hearts. And as David later spoke in the same psalm, create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit in us. So Lord, I pray that. Come on, pray that for you. I pray that for all of us joining and I pray that for the body of believers that is named by the name of Jesus. Create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit in your church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, thanks for watching today. To not miss out on any of our videos, hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. And by the way, if you're interested in starting a house church, whether under The Rock, a four square church, or under Solid Lives, our global discipleship ministry, then go to one of those websites and hit house churches. Go to therock.com for The Rock and solidlives.com for Solid Lives. We'd love to partner with you to start a house church and to advance the kingdom of God together.